I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab a Bible or turn, take your Bible app and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3 is our text uh, and today. And, and if you're here in the room at Sweetwater, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you don't have one or if you don't have a Bible app uh, and turn to page 1166, you'll find Philippians chapter 3. If you're joining us from our campus in Parker, then right now, just and you don't have a Bible, jump up and run back to the table in the middle of the room, grab one of those Bibles, and take it back to your seat, turn to page 1,166. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, uh, I'm sorry, but if you'll let us know where you are, we'll send you one or bring one to you, because we want everyone to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, now, I just... Got to give you a little bit of warning. We're looking at verses 12 through 16 tonight and uh, today. And if you are uh, somebody who's a little bit OCD or you're somebody who's been following really carefully, you're going to understand that this is out of order. Some of you are like, we're in Philippians 3, but we're starting in verse 1. We missed verse 1. Why are you going to verse 12? And, and the explanation is really simple. Uh, Pastor Joe and I, we have our sermon schedule. We have it planned out literally months in advance, uh, and, uh, and so we had it all planned out, and then his travel plans changed, and, uh, and I was here, and he wasn't. <laughs> so you're, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 16 tonight, and, and I hope that that is okay with you, and in Parker, I hope that uh, you are good with that, and so uh, join us uh, in looking at this text. Hey, let me ask you a question. Have you ever looked at someone and wondered how did they become so successful? How did they become so successful? I mean, maybe you're looking at them and, and athletically, they're incredible and you're like, I, I wish I could do that. Or maybe financially, they're successful and you're like, well, why did, you know, how did they get all that money? Or maybe it's somebody who's famous or maybe it's somebody who's influential or maybe it's somebody in politics. You go, how did they get there? Now, sometimes when we think that thought, because let's be honest, we all think that thought sometimes. Sometimes we're just being judgmental and envious, right? As in, how did they become successful, right? How did they get there? Because obviously I'm more talented, better looking. Uh, I should have more money than that, you know? And so there's envy on that part. So that's part of it, but that's not what I'm really talking about. I'm talking about a lot of times we really want to know the secret to their success. How did they get successful? We really want to know because we would like to be successful. Well, today we are talking about success. We're talking about success. So I just want you to know, if, if you want to know how to be a, a wealthy financial success, I am not the person to ask. Okay? If you want to learn how to be famous uh, and a social media influencer, I'm clueless. If you hope to discover how to be politically successful, not only do I have no answer, but I don't care. <laughs> okay? Just being honest. But if you want to know how to build a successful life, at least according to the Apostle Paul, I can share with you the secret to success. Although it's not really a secret, since it's printed in the best-selling book in all of history. Okay, I don't know if you realize that, but if they were honest on the bestseller list, the Bible would be number one every single week that it's been in existence. Uh, it's just the best-selling book. So it's, it's out there for everyone to see if we're willing to hear it. So Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12, this is what the apostle says. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Pause right there. If we had done this in the right order, you would already know what he's talking about. He's talking about not that I've already obtained this. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about being made perfect by Jesus, uh, achieving that, that ultimate salvation that we're all aiming for. He says, I haven't gotten there yet uh, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it the salvation of Jesus, my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. 
Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Okay, so in this few verses, the Apostle Paul is talking about how you can have a plan for success. Again, it's not so secret. It's written there black and white. Millions, if not billions of people have read this. Uh, it's really not just about knowing it. It's about applying it. But the first step in this plan for success is to focus on the progress, not perfection. Focus on progress, not perfection. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. The Apostle Paul hadn't arrived. He, he's acknowledging that that he's not perfect. And, and get this, this is a tension that we all live in as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, if, you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this isn't gonna make sense. By the way, this plan's not really gonna work for you. Uh, but if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, it's personal. You believe that God raised him from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you're living in this tension of you're not perfect yet. Because we've trusted Jesus, we've confessed our sin, we've repented, and, and all of our sins have been forgiven. We are justified standing before God. And one day in the future, when we leave this world, whether it's through death or Christ's return, we're going to be made perfect perfect. At least there's one person awake right now. It's like, hey, it's so hot, we don't care. Well, I hope you care because one day you, as a follower of Jesus, are going to be made perfect. And the older I get, the more exciting that is because the more stuff hurts all the time. Right? And, and so, you know, you're like, hey, I'm going to get a new body. I, I'm not going to have these, you know, urges for self-destruction. It's all going to be replaced. Well, that's, that's the salvation that Paul says, I have not attained that yet. I haven't gotten there yet. So, so we're fully saved by Jesus in the fact that our sins are forgiven. We've got perfection ahead of us, and right now we're living in the tension between those two points. We're living in that tension. We want to be better than we are, but we're not there, and we know what we're going to be, but we can't get there just yet. So today we live between those moments and some of us struggle with guilt. Some of us struggle with guilt. Some of us struggle with feelings of failure. We have a sense of inadequacy because we know we don't measure up. Why? Because we're not perfect. And somewhere along the way, either somebody told us we're supposed to be perfect or we grew up in churches where they, everybody pretended to be perfect even though we knew they weren't. And we think that we have to measure up to somebody else's standard and because we know we don't measure up to God's standard. By the way, if you're sitting here going, but I'm not good enough, praise God. I'm glad you know that. That's the first step in asking Jesus to save you. Because if you think you're good enough, you're not. But if you think you're not good enough, you're correct. See, that's why we need grace. That's why we sing about amazing grace because we, we have to rely on the grace of God. If we're gonna get to heaven, then, then that's the whole salvation part. That's the whole believing in Jesus part. That's why it's so important for that confession. But we don't measure up. And for some of you, that's stopping you. That, that's a present thought in your life all the time. I don't measure up. I'm not being good enough. I'm not doing well enough. And the Apostle Paul, I want you to think about this. He's the author of half the New Testament. That's kind of a big deal. Okay? Okay author of half the New Testament. He was a missionary extraordinaire. He founded churches all over the Roman Empire. He saw Jesus in a vision on the road to Damascus. He heard the voice of Jesus, and he is telling us, along with the church in Philippi, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I haven't gotten there yet. That is so encouraging that the Apostle Paul wasn't perfect because none of us are perfect. If that offends you, you need to go ahead and step out of denial and into reality. Here, let me help you. Look at the person next to you, smile, and say, you're not perfect. Make sure you say it, they say it back to you, okay? It's true both ways. Because you're not perfect. Hey, th this is just a, a, a freebie. But you know one of the problems in relationships is that 
guys, girls, you look at each other in that dating romance stage, and, and you go, oh, you're perfect for me. <laughs> and then you get married, and you spend the next, you know, whatever decades living with all their imperfections that drive you crazy. Because love is blind and stupid. But, uh, <laughs> hey, you guys know it's true if you're married. And if you're divorced, you really know it's true. So, uh, <laughs> but listen, can we just go ahead and understand and agree as the people of God that God doesn't expect us to be perfect? He knows you. He knows me. He knows our flaws, he knows our weaknesses, he knows our failures. Look, here's the scary part, he knows our thoughts. Look, if we were being judged by how good we are, we have no hope if he knows our thoughts. Okay, I, look, I don't know about you, I have no hope if it's based on my thoughts. Okay, because I know how evil I am, if you are half as evil, you're going to hell. But, but here's the thing, we're not going to hell because Jesus loves us and he saved us and he's given us life and hope and peace and, and that's the promise. So hear this, if you're struggling, understand that God does not expect perfection. He does not expect you to be the perfect Christian. He does not expect you to be the perfect spouse. He does not expect you to be the perfect mom. God doesn't expect perfection, he wants progress. I'm gonna say that again. He doesn't expect perfection. He wants progress. So here's the question. How are, how are you progressing? What kind of progress are you making? I'm not asking you if you feel better about yourself or don't feel better about yourself. This isn't about feelings. This is about looking at your life and doing an assessment and saying, am I making progress? So are you growing in your faith? You know, that's kind of subjective, I don't know. But listen, if you're not growing in your faith, next Sunday night, we're gonna be offering a brand new class as part of our Next Steps classes. You know, we've got intro, we've got serve, we've got lead, but this is grow class. It's about growing in your faith. Pastor Joe's gonna be introducing it next Sunday night. It's supposed to be a preview just for leaders. You're all invited, okay? Just uh, grab a connect card if you wanna go, fill out, fill it out, drop in the offering box, say I'm gonna go to the Grow class, five o'clock. It's gonna be about an hour and a half long. We got childcare provided, you need to sign up for that. But if you wanna do something, then, then do it. You know, are you making progress in your faith? Are you, are you progressing? Are you, are you reading the Bible and praying? Not planning to, hoping to, intending to, but I'm talking about actually doing it. Because if you read and apply God's word, God will change your life. If you think about reading God's word and don't apply anything because you don't know anything, it, God's not gonna change your life. You're not gonna make progress. Are you overcoming your sins, your habits, your addictions? Are you making progress? If you're not, then show up Monday night, 6.30, in this room for Celebrate Recovery. Okay, they'll help you make some progress or at least call you out if you're playing the denial game. Look, are you, are you making progress in your relationships? Are your relationships healthier? Are you getting better as a parent? Are your finances more responsible? Because God does not expect you to be perfect, but he does expect you to be going forward, to be making progress. So don't evaluate and judge yourself based on perfection because God doesn't expect you to be perfect, but he does expect progress. That's step one. Step two, celebrate how God has redeemed your past. Celebrate how God has redeemed your past. Uh, look, I love verse 13. Listen to this again. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Let me just pause right there. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. We all have a past. Every one of us in this room has a past. Unless there's a baby that someone's holding in their arms right now, they don't have much of a past. But if you're, if you're an adult, you got a past. And Paul is not advocating for selective amnesia. He's not advocating for group denial about, oh, we don't remember anything from the past, okay? He's not for that. He, we all have a past. We have past successes and we have past failures. We have past joys and past sorrows, past mistakes and past regrets. By the way, Frank Sinatra was a liar. 
okay? Old people will get that. Uh, first two, song, my way, Google it, okay? The temptation that many of us face, okay? There, there's kind of two temptations when it comes to our past. One is to just deny our mistakes, and if we deny our mistakes, mistakes, we're unable to learn from them. That's a scary place to be. That's how you get old and stupid, okay? <laughs> Look, we all expect people to be young and stupid because they don't know any better, but old and stupid is kind of sad, okay? That comes from denying your mistakes, refusing to claim responsibility and learn from them, okay? So that's one temptation. The other temptation, the one that's more prevalent, especially in the church, is the temptation to focus on our mistakes and wallow in regret, to live in disappointment and frustration and anger about what we did in the past. Okay, look, I grew up in churches where, you know, if you made a mistake, people wanted to brand you with that for the rest of your life. You're guilty, you're always guilty, and, and they wanna remind you of that, and you remind yourself of that, and people get stuck in their past. And can I just tell you that getting stuck in your past, wallowing in your mistakes, living with regret all the time is a great recipe for failure. You want a life that's full of failure, you just stick, stick on all the stuff you've done wrong in the past, okay? But we're not talking about failure, we're talking about success. And if you wanna be successful, then see how God has redeemed your past and celebrate. Okay, name it, I made a mistake, confess. Okay, that's what confession is, naming it. And then repent of it, that's change. I'm not gonna do that anymore, I'm giving that up, I'm changing my ways. And then talk about how God has redeemed that, which leads us to celebration. That's a picture we, we paint every single time we baptize somebody. They're admitting that they're a failure. They're, they're calling upon Jesus. They're repenting of their sins, and they, they come up out of that water, a new creation. Uh, that's the picture of redemption, which is why we celebrate it. So basically, you're going to live, you know, kind of one of two ways. You're either going to focus on your past failures, and if you focus on your past failures, you're going to live in fear of the future failures. Oh, no, what if I mess up again? And if you're afraid of messing up again, it's going to steal your joy and take away your hope. And you're going to live your life anticipating the next failure rather than celebrating the redemptive power of God. The second way you can live is to focus on redemption, to live in the expectation of God's grace and his power in your life. When you live in the expectation of God's grace and power, redeeming your mistakes, redeeming your, you know, your tragedies, redeeming your failures, then that fills you with so much hope and joy that it spills out on other people. You're like a drunk at a football game. Everybody's going to be wearing the beer, okay? Right? You hate that then, but if somebody's spilling out joy and, and hope on everybody, then you're like, hey, that's pretty good. I like that. Let's go ahead and live like that. And one of the reasons that Calvary is the church that it is is because we focus on how God redeems our past failures, mistakes, and losses. Okay, we celebrate it personally. You've, you've seen it. You've seen the, the, we tell the stories of brokenness, the failure, loss, addiction, and how God has redeemed, restored, healed, and blessed people. We, we love to share those testimonies. We love to point people uh, to that. And so over and over and over again, we celebrate it. And if you're sitting here going, I just don't believe it, I've never seen it, then see me afterwards. I'll give you a list of names, or better yet, show up Monday night at 6.30 and meet some of those people. Okay? Because they inhabit Celebrate Recovery like crazy. So do it, you, you know, we, we see that in person, but we also see that as a church. We celebrate God's redemption as a ministry. So I've, I've been pastor of Calvary for over 29 years, okay? And I've made plenty of mistakes as the pastor of Calvary. I mean, I have made some absolutely horrible hires. I mean, I hired a, a con man embezzler, okay, to start our school ministry. It was terrible, okay? We've, we've attempted to do ministries that failed gloriously. We've empowered leaders that couldn't lead. We've said things, I, literally, I, I've said stuff crazy from the pulpit. You guys have heard some of it. And... Uh, it just, I could spend all night telling you about a multitude of failures that I have led Calvary through, okay? And, and then there's been pain. As a church, there's been lots of pain. I mean, we've performed over 500 funerals in that time period. We've counseled through many broken marriages, even some of my friends. We've experienced church fights and splits, and people have left 
I've had friends leave the church. I could share extensively about the pain. But here's the thing. God has redeemed. In amazing and wonderful ways, God has healed, God has restored, God has blessed, God has reconciled. God has allowed us to grow from about 100 people to over 2,500 people on a weekend. I think that's kind of cool. Oh, I guess way better than that. We've baptized over 2,000 people professing Jesus in those 29 years. See, that's kind of cool. I go, look what God's done. So who cares about the pain? Who cares about the, the, the struggles? Who cares about the failures? Look, we've invested millions of dollars in missions, impacting lives with the gospel in Havasu and Parker and to the ends of the earth. I, I mean... See, that's why we're a church that values contagious celebration because we want to celebrate how God redeems. And we want to do it over and over and over again. So, another question. Are you celebrating how God has redeemed your life? And some of you are going, I don't see it. I don't see how God has redeemed my life. But if that's the case, if you really can't see how God has redeemed your life, then please schedule an appointment with one of the pastors. We will help you to see it. We'll hear your story. We'll point out how God redeems. Or, again, show up at Celebrate Recovery. They will help you figure it out. Okay? So, focus on progress, not perfection. Celebrate how God has redeemed your past. And if you want to be successful, press on for the prize. Press on for the prize. He says it right there, verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on for the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Look, he, he's pressing on. He says that. Verse 12, I press on. Verse 13, I'm straining forward. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal. So how do we understand what it means to press on? First of all, what are you pressing for? you got to have the right prize, and the prize that, that Paul's talking about pressing towards is Jesus, right? I'm pressing on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is my target. This is my aim. This is what I'm fighting for. This is what I'm yearning for. This is what I'm straining for. It's all about Jesus. So make sure your prize is right, because if, if your prize is to have the best family, it's going to disappoint you. If your prize is to have all the money, you're going to end up empty. Oh, you'll have lots of toys, but you'll be empty on the inside. If it's fame, it's the wrong prize. You're going to end up sad. And can I just tell you, as someone who never expected any applause or any accolades, that they don't satisfy. They really don't. If you're living your life for, for that, it's not going to It's not going to satisfy. But if your life is focused on Jesus, if you know the right prize, then press on. Press on to take hold of Jesus. So what does pressing on mean? Two things. Live on purpose. Pressing on means you are living intentionally. You are moving forward with a plan. You have a target that you are aiming at. Look, all of us want to do great things, or when we did when we were young, right? We, we, we want to see great things happen through our lives, and God wants us living intentionally for him. He wants you living on purpose for him, pressing on in that way. So what does that look like? If successful living is living intentionally for God, what does that look like? It looks like a lot of different things that are wrapped up in obedience. It means, husbands, you love your wives on purpose. On purpose. Yeah, you know what that looks like? Because love is patient and love is kind. It means stop being selfish and demanding. Repent of being selfish. Here, let me translate that to a really understandable language. And it's Father's Day weekend, so I'll have to apologize, guys, for offending you at this point. But it means that you serve your wife. And serving your wife means that you help out with the chores around the house. Okay? Guys, it means that sometimes you need to do the dishes and clean the toilet. Okay? Ladies, I cannot believe there was no applause on that one. <laughs> I mean, really? I have to prompt it? You guys missed your opportunity right there. Might have to edit that out for the later sermons. I don't know. So, so here's the thing. I mean, you got, if, if you want to see success, then, then you need to take this seriously. Okay? Live on purpose. Wives, respect your husbands, which means that you need to repent of nagging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I didn't have to prompt the guys. Uh, 
Hey, look, ladies, nagging does not equal encouragement. All right? Nagging does not equal encouragement. And so, ladies, thank your husbands for who they are and what they do well. Commend your children for doing the things that are, that are good and right. It, 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 it's what God wants us to do. If we're going to live on purpose for Jesus, it's, this gets really practical. Hey, look, Americans, how about we stop obsessing over the latest political outrage and thank God for the amazing country that we live in? I mean, we are so blessed by prosperity and freedom. We need to celebrate that reality. And yet some of us are mired in constant complaints about where we are. And, and I just look around and I go, it's not really not so bad. We're kind of blessed a lot. Christians, how about instead of lamenting the darkness that is enveloping our world, we rejoice because now our light can shine all the brighter in the darkness around us. See, that's what it means to be on purpose and say, okay, God, you're in control and you're in charge and you've called me and I'm gonna serve you and I'm gonna take your word and I'm gonna apply it to my life. There's that thing again. If we read and apply God's word, God will change our life, we'll show up and we'll start being successful. See, living on purpose for Jesus means being obedient in the little things and watching God bless you in amazing ways. Some of us want to see God bless us in amazing ways and then we'll maybe be obedient. No, it doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Jesus calls us to obedience. When you're obedient to him, he's going to bless you incredibly. That only happens if you're living on purpose. Pressing on means living on purpose and pressing on means that you don't give up. Don't give up. I mean, you know, you, it, pressing on, the opposite of that is giving up. You understand, pressing on is about endurance. Endurance means you don't give up. And you may feel like it, but don't give up. You may think there's no point in trying. Don't give up. You may believe you've completely blown it and there's no possible chance to recover. Don't give up. You may think you are beyond help or hope. Please don't give up. Don't quit on God, don't quit on church, don't quit on worship, don't quit on your friends, don't quit on life. Press on. Can I just tell you that endurance is foundational throughout Scripture? So you can say, hey, it's really bad for me. Yeah, press on. You can say, it really hurts a lot. Yes, press on. You can say, I'm really broken. Yes, press on. Why? Because God's going to redeem your life if you press on. In, in writing to the Romans in chapter 5, by the way, if you're struggling with this, read Romans chapter 5, the begin, especially the beginning, where, he, where Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings. That's insane, but keep on. Because suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope will not disappoint. You go, why is it so hard? Because God wants to grow you up and help you to be mature. He wants to see you successful, and the only way you get there is if you do what? Press on. If you don't give up. Um, now, if you feel like giving up, or if you're being tempted to give up. I've got a verse for you. Galatians chapter six, verse nine. You probably need to make it your verse. You need to write it down, put it all over your house, on your mirrors, in your car, everywhere you're gonna see it. Simply says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if, guess what? We do not give up. Do you, you, you hear God's promise? Look, don't, don't get too tired, don't get exhausted in doing good because in due time, if, if you're faithful, if you keep pressing on, you're gonna reap a harvest if you don't quit. I love that promise. You have no idea how important it is to press on. See, that's the secret. That's the secret to success. Focus on progress, not perfection. Celebrate how God has redeemed your past and keep pressing on. Don't quit on Jesus. And if you do that, you're gonna find success in life. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, the first step is to confess him as Savior and Lord and experience the life we're talking about so that you have a reason to press on. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. 
It's, it's, sometimes it's hard to believe that you love us because you know us and, you, and you've forgiven us of all of our sins. You know our thoughts, you know our hearts, you know the evil that's in us, and yet you keep chasing us, you keep encouraging us, you keep picking us up when we fall and putting us back on our feet. And God, we thank you for that. And Lord, we know we're not perfect, so help us to stop trying to, to live in that perfection, but instead... Help us to celebrate and rejoice in the progress that we make. And God, I pray that every person in this room would be able to see how you have redeemed their past. And I pray that they would be able to experience and celebrate uh, your life and keep pressing on. We thank you that you have not given up on us. And we commit to not giving up on you. In Jesus' name, amen.